it must have been a prophetic message that I gave to the Sunday school class because I mentioned that I cry a lot. And then after hearing Jen sing that song, uh, where's Jen at? Where is Jen? Firehouse. Jen, if you can hear me, um, I know, you know I know that Jen, she was singing that to Jesus. I know she was singing that to Jesus, and I know that that song spoke to a lot of you out here this morning. Uh, so we want to give glory to God for that song. Um, if you're a visitor, welcome. We're glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. There's an info card uh, on the, inside the bulletin you can fill out. You can throw in the offering tray when you're heading out, and I will creep you. I'll have somebody creep you, and we'll hopefully get in touch with you. Um, just to give you a heads up, we've been going through the Sermon on the Mount, and we are now with, uh, wow, I don't know what week we're on, but we're, we've been doing this little mini-series right now. Three messages where Jesus uses this phrase, when you, and this morning, if you're a visitor, you think, what in the world's going on? We're going to talk about fasting. Uh, it's not a topic that's preached much. I had never heard a sermon on fasting until I preached one about a year and a half ago in this sanctuary. So uh, here we go. Who's ready to fast? You know, I just had my fill of, of Priscilla's amazing baked oatmeal. Thank you, Priscilla. And then I had to add... A donut to that. Uh, uh, so uh, <laughs> I just now noticed my wife's wearing a T-shirt that says she has dibs on the pastor. Awesome! <laughs> Does that mean I can eat as many donuts as I as I desire as long as I fast here and there? Okay. All right. <laughs> let's get going here. Uh, let's talk about weight loss because sometimes when you hear the word fast, you think about weight loss, but that's not what fasting is about. But weight loss. Fads. I'm going to say fads and diets. They come and go. I think it's Marie Osmond, Slim Fast. Um, what else is out there? The Jenny Craig, uh, the Keto Diet, the High Protein Diet, the Low Carb Diet, the High Fat Diet, the Daniel Diet. Um, actually, there's one called the All Meat Diet. Ron, you might like that. Ribeyes, bacon, and burgers all day, brother. How about that? Let's have some bacon. All kinds of diets, and there's two reasons there are diets out there promoted. Number one reason for, for diets, somebody wants to make a profit. Somebody wants to make a profit. That's the number one reason. And the second reason, the, the byproduct, is that somebody hopefully will lose some weight. There you go. Now, how many of you have you heard of this new phenomenon in the country? It's called intermittent fasting. Anybody heard of intermittent fasting? Oh, some of you had. I'll call it IF. Here's how IF works. It's not really a diet because the focus is not so much on how much you eat or really what you eat, but rather when you eat, the timing of your eating. Okay, that's what intermittent fasting is based on. Um, and you think about our culture today. We live in a culture where, hey, guys, it's been ingrained in our minds that you will eat three times a day, and if you want to, you can supersize every one of those meals, right? You can supersize breakfast. You can supersize your drinks. You can supersize your coffees. Everything is supersized. We have that option. Intermittent fasting is a little opposite of that. It doesn't really base everything on having your three required meals a day or the two snacks in between. It reduces the time span where you're allowed to eat. Uh, one method is called the 16-8, where you have 16 hours of fasting. You have an eight-hour window to eat. Now, that doesn't mean you can just eat four pizzas and two whole cakes within that eight hours. That would not make sense. But that's one method. Um, I have friends that adhere to this quite strictly. Uh, one acronym is OMAD, which is one meal a day. Do you have that acronym, OMAD? And when I see that, one meal a day, I think that's what that literally means. Oh, man, I'm so mad. I have somewhat adhered to the one called the acronym TMAD, uh, which would be uh, two meals a day. It's a little more forgiving. Uh, there's another method called Eat, Stop, Eat, where you actually once a week where you have a 24-hour fast within the week. And I will tell you, there are, there are uh, well-known health benefits to fasting. Your HGH levels will rise. Uh, your insulin levels will sometimes stabilize. There's cellular repair that takes place, and the weight loss, that's just a side effect. There are many health benefits to fasting. 
This morning, we're going to hear Jesus use this phrase again in a very authoritative tone, when you. The last two weeks, when you give, give humbly. When you pray, pray in silent, pray humbly. And this morning, he's going to make this phrase known about fasting, when you fast. And so this morning, what I want to do, I want to try and answer some of these questions that pertain to this holy discipline of fasting. And it's a discipline that's not taught much, it's not talked about, because lo and behold, we like our food. Me and my wife just talked about this, that how many times, how much food do we actually throw away every night? How much food goes into the garbage can? We have an abundance of food in this country. So I want to ask the question, what is biblical fasting? Should a Christian fast? Should you fast in the 21st century? Is it still legit? Really, do I have to fast? Are you telling me, is there a commandment that says you have to fast? And if so, how long would you have to fast? What are the benefits of fasting? We're going to to touch all those topics. But let's begin, as we always have been, with Jesus and his expectations pertaining fasting. Because he does say, when you fast. Not if you fast. Or if you choose to fast, but when you fast, because it was built into the culture. Um, uh, my question is, so is fasting, which was prevalent, which was taught in the first century, has fasting been gradually phased out of the church? Has it been phased out, or is fasting a biblical teaching that is still relevant today? And I'll tell you from my study of the scriptures and my understanding of the scriptures and from the words of Jesus... And when I take a look at the spiritual realm of not only this country, but the entire world, when I look at the worldview today that's prevalent, I would say it's a resounding yes. The discipline of fasting is still relevant, and I will tell you, I believe it's needed. I will tell you this, and this is not in a boastful way, but when the leadership team first started meeting, and we first started talking about merging We went on uh, a fast. For months and months and months, the leadership team decided to fast once a week for 24 hours until God said stop fasting. And for me personally, I don't know if we have United Christian Church, if we didn't double down our prayers with fasting. Because I think fasting has that type of power. I'll say this, you do not have to fast. You get to fast. You get to partake in the blessings of fasting. And I'll tell you, there are many within the church today that see the revival of the individual believer and see the revival of the modern-day church here in America. It's going to be at a standstill and stagnant unless we start fasting again. I mentioned this. Our early forefathers during the Revolutionary War, 13 times during the Revolutionary War, our nation's leaders called for a country-wide fast. It happened. I say it's still relevant. Let's go to the disciples and listen to Jesus teach. In John chapter 6, Jesus has taught this tough teaching. It's after the feeding of the 20,000, and they come back for more food, and Jesus gives them spiritual food, and they don't like what, what he says. He basically says... You must eat my flesh and drink my blood to have a part of me. That's a radical statement, but he's really saying, you've got to be all in. You have to be part of me, and I part of you. But you know what happened that day? There were possibly hundreds of people that were deciding to follow Jesus, and that day, with that tough topic that you're all in, they left him. We are, they literally turned away, and they repented the other way. Not following Jesus anymore, too radical. And Jesus went to the 12 and says, how about you guys? You want to leave? You want to hightail it? Because I can get 12 more. And Peter replied, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. So I want to remind everybody here today, when Jesus says, uh, when you fast, those are red letters. Those are red letters in that old King James. He spoke those words. And the teachings of Jesus, they do not fade away. They still have authority. Today's present culture, today's progressive culture, 
does not take precedence over the teachings of Jesus for the church. They do not. Jesus still has the power and the authority to transform us, to transform the believer, and to transform culture. Culture does not change Jesus and his teachings. And so I think and I believe the disciple, the Christ follower, with humility will fast to deepen the relationship with God. So, let's ask this question. What is fasting? It's not a diet. It is simply to go without food for a specific purpose for a predetermined amount of time. That is biblical fasting. I just had breakfast. We have named our first meal of the day after fasting. We have broken that 12-hour fast that we just participated in. We broke it. Now we feed. We feast. Fasting is not a diet. It's not a hunger strike. It's not done for political reasons or political influence. And I've heard of people that have fasted from, the, from social media, from TV, from, from the news channels, from their phones. I was forced to fast from my phone for five days after my wife lost it in a state park. Oh, boy. I just got a glare. No, it was a blessing, darling. But fasting in the truest biblical sense is abstaining from all food for a time for God. It is really, I, that song, I want more, anybody know that? I want more of you, God. Well, I remember Caleb Rogers saying that when he was our, our worship pastor. I want more of you, God. That's, that's what fasting can do for you when you're lacking that statement. Because some of us get in a law, and we don't want much of God anymore. And so fasting has the power to revive your love of Christ. To say, I crave you. I crave you more than that apple fritter that I just had. Here's another question. How long should I fast if I decide to fast? And there's no set time on fasting. It could be one meal. It could be two meals, it could be one day, it could be 21 days. I don't know what it is. I will tell you that Jesus fasted for 40 days. Moses fasted for 40 days on Mount Sinai. Daniel fasted for 21 days. The beautiful queen Esther, she fasted for three days. The length of your fast is between you and your God. What the Holy Spirit lays upon your heart. And I will say along with that, depending upon your medical conditions... Some of you would probably need to speak to your doctor and see if it would be a wise adventure for you to take on the fast. Some maybe not. Take care of your body. In the first century, to those that Jesus lived with, and Jesus knew of this event, the Jewish people were actually expected to fast one day a year. That was a day of atonement. We call it Yom Kippur. It was a day that was dedicated to prayer and to fasting where amends were made for the sins of the nation of Israel. And lo and behold, when that time came next year, they would go into the Holy of Holies, take the blood of animals, and sprinkle the blood in the altar, and the sins will be atoned for. That happened year after year after year after year after year. Until the perfect sacrifice arrived, the eternal sacrifice arrived, and that is Jesus. Jesus himself replaced the annual atonement. He replaces Yom Kippur. His final atonement made amends for your sins and my sins. And it wasn't in the temple. It wasn't a beautiful ceremony. It was at Golgotha. And right next to Golgotha was a trash pit where garbage was burned and, and bodies were burned. That's where his atonement was made for you. In a place of humility and mockery. 1 Peter 3.18 For Christ died for sins once and for all. The righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body but made alive by the Spirit. That is our atonement. Perhaps. And I'm going to get to this at the end of the message. Perhaps we as a body of believers, we should consider a fast. Maybe we should consider our own day of atonement. Or the day of fasting for this church. Jesus is always in this teaching 
uh, segment of the Sermon on the Mount, he gives us a how not to and a how to. And here it says how not to fast. So here it is. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces to show others that they are fasting. And truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. The hypocrites, who are they? They are the Pharisees. They are the teachers of the law. And what they were doing when they fasted, which they fasted one to two times a week for 24 hours. And what they did, they made sure that everybody knew about it. They were actually acting like they wanted a golden globe or they wanted that Oscar trophy when they fasted. Because they would distort their faces and, oh man, my stomach hurts and, oh, woe is me. And that's what they did. And Jesus calls them out for their gloomy looks and their sad clown faces. That's what they did. And I actually see the the sense of humor when Jesus makes a statement. Stop disfiguring your faces. Guys, you've been fasting for 24 hours and you act like you fasted for 40. Please stop your performing. Come back to reality. You know, we had in youth group, Donica knows this, we had a 30-hour famine every year for many years in our youth group where we would fast for 30 hours to raise money for World Vision. And it started at noon on Friday, and it ended at 6 p.m. on Saturday. And at 6 p.m. on Saturday, we would go to Villa Pizza and then gorge ourselves. That's how we ended the fast. But about 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon on Saturday, you know what happened to those kids? They're laying on the ground. And they're moaning, oh, I'm so hungry, my belly hurts. Guys, it's only been 26 hours, you can do it. And so what Jesus is saying, listen, don't make your fast so apparent that you're going to receive praise from the outside world. If you decide to fast, and you make it it apparent to others, with disfiguring your face, you're saying, oh, my belly hurts, I'm fasting. They will applaud you, and they will congratulate you and pat you on the back. Good job, Ryan. You fasted for 24 hours, and then you just forfeited your heavenly reward. There are rewards for humble giving. There are rewards for humble praying, and you will be rewarded in heaven for humble fasting. God is fair and just, so do not fast for show. Look at me. Don't do it. Then Jesus describes for us, here are the guidelines. Here's how you fast. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. There's that key word. The key word there is secret. Fast in secret. Fast in humility. When you fast... Put your fasting cloak on, your incognito cloak, so nobody knows you're fasting. They can't recognize it. This phrase, oil your head and wash your face, you know what that really is? Guys, that is just simple, good, clean hygiene. In the first century, when those people lived outdoors much of the day, it was common to anoint your head. I wouldn't need it anointed because of this bald spot as they got burned every day out in the field. So it was a common practice to anoint the head, as a sign of the Holy Spirit, to anoint the face. It was common hygiene. And so when I read this for me, Steve, if you're going to fast, you know what you need to do? At the end of your fast, shave your goatee, trim that thing up, shave, take a shower, use conditioner, put your gold bond face cream on to try and get rid of your wrinkles, do that again. And a couple shots of, of aftershave and be on your merry way. Look normal. Don't distort your face for praise. Your fasting is to be noticed by God alone. Pastor, author John Stott, he writes this. The purpose of fasting is not to advertise ourselves, but to discipline ourselves. Not to gain a reputation for ourselves, but to express our humility unto a holy God. That's it. God, I need you more than food. God, I need you more than sustenance. Can you make that claim today? Do you need God more than lunch? Do you need God more than lunch? 
are you planning your lunch right now? If you're planning your lunch, lunch right now, shame on you. <laughs> I've probably been guilty of it, though, if the pastor gets long-winded. <laughs> now, that doesn't mean you cannot tell anyone of your fasting experiences. It might, it might help promote, it might encourage someone to consider a fast. But it's always done in a spirit of humility. And what I want to do this morning, I want to give you four biblical reasons on reasons to fast. And that's really hard for us to take in this culture because, guys, we love our food. We love to grill. We love drive through We love all that. That's how we're tailored. Number one reason, I think this is the most important reason to consider a fast, and that's to renew your hunger for Christ. Because many times, the book of Revelation speaks of this, that many times we lose our first love for Jesus, and that first love becomes diminished because... That's just what the world does to us. It tries to draw us away from Christ. A fast is a way to draw yourself closer to him. Joel 2.12, even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Guys, let's be real today, can we? I think you're all in the same boat as me. At times in our journey with Jesus and our journey to Jesus, I remind you, we are only citizens here. We are part-time inhabitants of the earth. We will reside in heaven with Jesus. We're on a journey to Jesus. I am hoping to get to Jesus. But on that journey at times, our walk with Christ becomes dry, it becomes stale, and it becomes distant at times. Anybody ever been there? I've been there. Everybody goes through a spiritual lull, a spiritual depression. And many times what happens is that we take the prodigal road. We take the prodigal path. Believers can do that. It happens. We take what I call the off-ramp. I have an image of, of what I'm talking about here. Many of us will be walking God's way, and I, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper and to, for you to succeed, and we're walking on that path, and lo and behold, we see an off-ramp, and it's what I want to do, and it's some of the pleasures that I want to partake of, and we take that ramp. And we get out of line. We get out of our lane. And we fall away from Christ. And our spirituality dwindles. A fast of repentance, a returning to God, a Father, may I come back. Father, I desire again. That fast can spur that type of heartfelt repentance, even for a believer. Even though our sins are forgiven, we're a child of God, he loves us like crazy, at times we can become the prodigal. Here's the beauty of God Almighty, guys, as being your Abba Father. If you read that story of the prodigal son, and if you've been there, been the prodigal, here's what happens. When the prodigal son decides to repent, because that's what he does, he's partaking of the world, and he decides to repent, he says, I'm going to start, I want to go back to, I want to go back home. I want to go back home. Do you know that the father, and most fathers would do this, the father is not standing at the doorstep waiting to discipline the son. He's not. The father gets wind of the repentant son, and the son doesn't run to the father. The father runs to the son. God the father runs to the repentant son and says, Come here. Here's new clothes. Here's a ring. Here's blessings. Here's a meal. That's our Father. And the fast can get you into the arms of the Father if you've avoided the arms of the Father. I tell you what, you place yourself in that prayer closet with an empty stomach, and God will show up. And God will embrace you. And God will close yourself upon Him, and you'll hear the heartbeat of God like you've never heard before. And the emphasis is that your first love for Jesus comes back. Number two reason to fast is to receive direction and revelation. The Apostle Paul sought this out. You know, the Apostle Paul hops into the book of Acts about chapter 9. And then we read about him in chapter uh, 13. And we read this. Now in the church at Antioch, as they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said... Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. And so after they had fasted and prayed, fasted and prayed, fasted and prayed, that is a dynamic duo, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. 
And when I read this passage of Scripture, it appears that it's just the elders of the church, but I believe it's the entire church that is fasting for this event. They get a feel that something's going to happen with the gospel. It's been tied to Israel. It's been tied to Jerusalem. Oh, my guys, I think God's going to do something crazy. We want to be a part of it. And so you know what they do? They start to pray. God, what would you have us do? And then they fast. Because we need direction and we need revelation. You know, Jerusalem at this time is still the mother church. It's still the city of David. But Antioch, which is Paul's home church, you know what happens? Antioch becomes the outreach base. That's where all the mission work is going to come out of, from the city of Antioch. And they have the entire church up there praying and fasting. What would you have us do, God? Is it possible that the gospel will go outside of Israel? And God said, yes, it is. And so after prayer and fasting, they receive, guess what? In Revelation, Paul and Barnabas, give me Paul and Barnabas, and I'm going to have them share the gospel to the Gentiles, and I'm going to give you direction. Go to the island of Cyprus. Go there. They hear it from the Holy Spirit. Direction and revelation can come from fasting and prayer. Does anyone in here today, do you have that question within your mind and your soul? God, what would you have me do with my life? I feel like I'm, I'm stagnant. God, what would you have me do in this situation, in this job, in this relationship, in this ministry? Maybe it's a certain opp- this opportunity has arisen. God, do I take this opportunity? What do I do? Consider the fast. Consider a humble prayer. Third reason you might want to consider the fast is a detox. It can detox the soul and the body. Because at times, guys, in the culture that we live in today, our soul can take on toxins that are against our spiritual makeup. Worldly toxins. And what happens? They get slipped in to what I'll call our spiritual goblets. We're drinking out of this spiritual goblet, trying to take in the word of Christ. But you know what? There's an evil one out there called Satan... And he's roaring around, prowling around like a lion, and he will drop toxins into your drink. He will spike your drink with negativity, with comparisons. We do this all the time. Oh, my gosh, look at that amazing family, the perfect family. Here I am. I'm divorced. Oh, my God. No, that's a toxin of comparison, pessimism, apathy, deception, deceit. Those are all toxins that can get within your soul. Jesus can cleanse your soul and detox it when it needs to be. He speaks of this when he talks about new wine and new wineskins. He said, no one pours new wine into old wineskins. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. Now, fasting, abstaining from food for a period of time, has the ability to not only cleanse the soul detoxify your soul, but it can actually rejuvenate it, renew it. Not that you need, you've already, you're born again, but at times our spirits need renewal. And that can happen with a fast. David prayed for this type of soul cleansing. You know what happened? After the affair with Bathsheba and the death of Uriah, he needed his soul clean bad. And he cried out, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Dr. D.L. Moody, he said that God does not seek vessels of gold. God does not seek out vessels of silver, but God must have clean vessels to work through. A humble fast can clean the soul. Let's talk about our bodies. Let's talk about our physical bodies today and fasting. Because we forget at times that this body and your body, they are actually temples of the living God. The Holy Spirit indwells you. You are a temple all these body, these 200 bodies sitting here today, you are more a temple than this building. Trust me. You are temples of the living God. Fasting has the ability to cleanse the body as well. Isaiah, he's preaching on fasting, and he says this, Your light shall break forth like the dawn, and your recovery, your healing of the body shall spring up quickly. Dr. Don Colbert, he made this statement concerning fasting. He said this, Fasting cleanses the body 
from built-up chemicals, metals, toxins. Fasting can revitalize you in every way, mentally, physically, and spiritually. And it also allows the overburdened liver to catch up on its detoxification process. Fasting has that type of power. I have really good friends, and they, I, asked, I called them this week. They own Oak Hall Valley Orchard over near Sullivan, Jennifer and Mike Mitchell. I worked with them, love them, and they are fasters. They are omads. Uh, they eat one meal a day, and I just talked to him, and today they're finishing a 48-hour fast. They randomly fast. And I said, what are the benefits of this type of fasting, which he ta- called it more of, of time management of food is what he calls it. And here's what he said that he has seen in his life since he's been partaking of this fasting. Overall holistic health, he said he, he guarantees me that his energy levels has doubled since he has fasted. He has a clarity of mind. He has insulin control. He has had inflammation reduction, fat removal, he will tell you, and I saw him, I mean, he looks great. He looks younger. He said it actually has, has tightened up his skin. And he said the weight loss everybody seeks out, that's not really a true benefit. That's just a side effect. That's just a side effect. It's all about the mind, body, and soul that the fast has that type of power. Consider the fast. Lastly, fasting will give our prayers power. I call it oomph. Uh, Jesus... Uh, in the story where the disciples went out and they tried to drive out a demon, they could not drive out this one particular demon for whatever reason. And the disciples came to Jesus and they said, why couldn't we drive out this demon? He's, he's too strong. Are we too weak? And Jesus told them this kind can come out only by prayer and fasting. Guys, prayer with fasting is a dynamic spiritual duo. We're just not taught it much. Now, fasting does not give us supernatural powers to perform miracles and healings. But prayer coupled with fasting, actually what it does, it draws us into our own personal sanctuary with God where we can actually hear his heartbeat. We understand the intimacy and the dependence upon God that every believer needs. I need you more than anything. I need thee every hour, that great hymn. I don't know if anybody's done this yet. I was going to ask the question, you know, I don't know how many of you got a prayer closet uh, I talked to Colin this week, and he has what he calls a, a prayer chariot. When he drives back and forth to work that whole hour, he's, he's worshiping, praising, and praying. Anybody got, your, anybody got a prayer closet picked out? I tell you what, I got one. I tell you what, you get in a closet, and you close the door, and you light a candle, and I'm not, trying to, I'm not saying I do this, huh? not that. But you get in there, and you're alone with God. I'm telling you, you can feel the presence of God like you've never felt before when you shut that door in the war room. And when you do it on an empty stomach, it's even more powerful. God desires our intimacy. And God really desires that we depend on him. We need to depend on him. Mark Batterson, many of you know Mark Batterson. He's the pastor at National Community Church in Washington, D.C. In the early 90s, he attempted a church plant in the city of Chicago, and it failed. It flopped. The church does not exist. It was a complete failure. In 1996, he was called to D.C. to head up a church. And the opening service, he had three members. I guess five, including him and his wife. Five members at the initial Sunday service. The next Sunday, it bumped up all the way to 19. And the average attendance for 1996 was 25 people at that National Community Church. Today, National Community Church is a multi-site church with thousands of members. And oh, by the way, it has a coffee house called Ebenezer's, and I believe five years ago it was voted the best coffee in D.C. The church has that going for him as well. Mark Batterson will testify without a doubt it wasn't him, it wasn't his speaking, it wasn't his intelligence, it was the vigilant prayer walks they took and the continual fasting that part they partook in. That is the only reason The National Community Church stands where it is today because of prayer and fasting, the dynamic duo. Uh, Batterson uses this illustration. I'm going to sort of highlight this. 
Fasting can be compared to what I call that last ditch sports event, that sports effort to win the game, right? We call it the, the flea flicker, uh, the Hail Mary pass, uh, the, the, the 14 laterals to get the touchdown right. Do you remember the play in 1982? I have an image of that. Can you put that up there? 1982, Stanford versus California. John Elway is playing for Stanford. They run down with four seconds left. They kick a field goal to win the game. They get penalized, so they have to kick off further back. So on the ensuing kickoff with four seconds left, Cal receives the kick. And the band is already coming on the field, the Stanford band. And what California did, they went with the last-ditch effort. They didn't run a normal play. They lateraled six times, and they scored a touchdown. And there's the, that was the ensuing touchdown. <laughs> right in the middle of the trombone player. Touchdown! The fast is our squeeze play. Our fast is stealing home. Our fast is something that sometimes in desperation we need to think of and take part of because it has that type of power to impact and has that type of power to provide victory. It does. At times, fasting is misunderstood and it's underutilized within the church. And I'm going to challenge everyone here today, start praying. Should I fast? Should I fast a meal, two meals? What should I do? But fasting, guys, is biblically taught by Jesus, and it is our trump card when we need extra power. Praise man, you can come on up. We'll end with this. There's a really good reason why Jesus exclaims, when you fast. Because prayer coupled with fasting, can fast-track you to God's purpose for your life. If you're asking the question, what what would God have me do? Oh, I'm just attending church, and that's all I do. God can fast-track you where you need to be with the fast. The fast can give you direction, revelation. It can cleanse your soul, and it can restore your love of Jesus if you feel like you've lost that love. Jesus has given us in this teaching three expectations, humble giving, humble praying, and humble fasting. Do you see the consistency in the word humble? Humility. Humility, guys, is rewarded. Humility is the key to your righteousness because humility is at the core of Christ. Christ sat in the throne room of heaven with his Father, angels worshiping him, And he said, turn me into a man. Turn me into a man. I'll have to breathe on my own. I'm going to get cuts and scrapes and bruises. I'm going to get hurt. Make me a man. Make me the creation. That took a lot of humility to leave the throne room of heaven into this earth and end up outside of a garbage pit crucified by pagans. That took humility. Let me read about the humility of Christ. Philippians 2, Jesus, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Guys, humility is the key to righteousness. Because it is the key to Jesus. Application, guys, I gave it to you. Consider a fast. If you've never fasted before, I'm going to tell you this. Start small. Maybe it's I'm going to fast one meal. Maybe it's two meals. Maybe it's one day. Consider your medical condition as well. But if you're going to fast, fast with a purpose. Don't fast to be seen. Don't fast just to fast because I said so. Fast with a purpose. Man, I want to be closer with Jesus. I want to depend on him more than my next meal. Fast with a purpose. And I'm going to challenge this church way early. This is an early challenge. I talked about the Day of Atonement. Do you know what the, you know what our Day of Atonement is? Our Day of Atonement is Good Friday. Our Day of Atonement is the day that Jesus 
was whipped and flogged at the, at the whipping post. Our day of atonement was when he was crucified. Our day of atonement was when they gambled for his clothes and mocked him. That's our day of atonement when he said, it is finished. And so I'm going to challenge United Christian Church. And if you're not a member here, that's fine. Our challenge this coming year, Good Friday, I say we fast for 24 hours on Good Friday because we want to become closer to Jesus, simply. Anyone feel the need to come forward and pray this morning for whatever need? You're free to come. If you want to join this church, you're free to come this morning. If you would like to be baptized, I've turned the baptistry on. We can baptize today. Really, a fast coupled with prayer is just pouring out your heart. I'm going to ask one of the elders, maybe Ed Taylor could come up. And if anybody feels the need to pray today, a simple prayer, Lord God, I need you. Lord God, I need you. I've been away. Come this morning. And if you've never given your life to Jesus, what a way to start. What a way to start. I give my life to you.